have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Daniel Seidman, who is an orthopedic surgeon with subspecialty training in the foot and ankle. He's an assistant professor at the Zucker School of, School of Medicine at Hofstra uh, Northwell in New York, having studied medicine at Tulane University and completed residency training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and fellowship training at UT Houston. The goal of his practice is to allow his patients to return to what they love, whether that's running marathons or walking along the High Line in New York City. Dan, take it away. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Emmons. This is a very pleasant uh, introduction. Uh, I want to thank OCAD for inviting me to participate in this event. It's an honor and a pleasure to discuss turf toe injuries and my personal insights and anecdotal experience with turf toe injuries. Ideally, prior to the development of post-traumatic arthritis and hallux rigidus, um, depending on what your local time zone is, I know we have people all over the world kind of joining in, or if you log in and see this recording, feel free to reach out to me and discuss at a later date if you have any further interest. Uh, as Dr. Uman said, I am Dr. Daniel Seidman. I'm an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon in New York City. I work at Lenox Hill Hospital, Meath, and LHGV and I'm part of the Northwell hospital system. Um, I have no conflicts of interest at this time and no financial disclosures associated with turf toe injury or any repair systems. So our agenda will uh, kind of address the who, what, where, when, how of turf toe injuries. Uh, prior to going further, I believe that our field of orthopedic foot and ankle surgery and uh, radiology associated with foot and ankle trauma was built on the shoulders of giants. Um, Dr. Thomas Clanton, Michael Coughlin, Robert Anderson, Norman Waldrop, and many others built the fundamental and foundational knowledge of how we assess, approach, and treat turf toe injuries in the athlete. Without their contributions to this specific area, there would likely be little evolution with regard to turf toe injury prevention, cleat modification, player safety, and there would likely be many less uh, athletes back on the field after their turf toe injuries without their contributions. I also hope they don't mind that I'm going to be borrowing some of their images um, from some of their uh, presentations in the past in this presentation. So we'll start out with a brief history of turf toe injuries and how this uh, pathology came to be. Here we have Patrick Mahomes from last year who was able to go on and win the national championship two years ago um, and he had a turf toe injury at that time. Um, so patients are and players and high level athletes are able to return to full activity after these injuries. Uh, however, depending on the severity of the injury can often affect the duration and time that they're out as well as their long term uh, prognosis. So a brief history of turf toe injuries. Artificial turf was introduced as a surface alternative to natural grass early in the 1960s. Um, most, if not all, uh, surfaces at that time or prior to that were on natural grass or in the winter in the Northeast in rainy seasons, they were large puddles of med mud or ice fields. Uh, in the 1960s, the new artificial surfaces, synthet synthetic turf were developed to decrease the exceedingly costly maintenance associated with natural grass. Additional benefits of this were more weather resistance, more utilization of the field, more time on the field, uh, and more durability of the field. With the op uh, sorry, adoption of the first generation turf fields across the collegiate and professional spheres of football, soccer, and rugby, there was previously underreported or new type of injury that was sidelining athletes, and in some cases leading to career ending injuries um, that were previously undiagnosed. While it's beyond the scope of this discussion today, there was a simultaneous trend in athletic shoe wear and cleats to have a more forgiving forefoot or less sturdy forefoot plate, leading to de decreased resistance against hyperextension or hyper dorsiflexion moments or injuries about the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint. There was and continues to be extensive interest into the pathology and the culmination of these trends led, led to what we today commonly refer to as turf toe injuries. 
with hyperextension injuries about the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint. Of note, at the apex of the turf toe injury rates in collegiate and professional uh, spheres, there was an average of 4.5 to 6.0 turf toe injuries per team per year in the collegiate uh, football arena. That meant that on average, those players were missing up to six plus days of athletic uh, time per season. Um, and often if it was a more severe injury, longer timeout, which was affecting the overall team's outcome. In addition, Rodeo published in the 1990s or in 1990, that between 50 and 80% of NFL players that were, uh, that were surveyed had a version of a turf toe injury or a metatarsal phalangeal joint sprain. The term turf toe was originally coined by Bowers and Martin in 1976 um, and has carried through over the last 40 years. The current state of artificial turf is in the third going on fourth generation of development. Um, the fourth generation has not been accepted by uh, most uh, professional athletic organizations governing bodies. Um, and that's specifically in, in uh, effort to maintain and avoid uh, injury to the people playing on the fields. Um, here we have a timeline associated with the progression of turf and the nature of what the turf is now composed of. It initially was a very, uh, did not mimic the characteristics of natural grass and therefore led to increased kind of gripping of the cleat uh, turf interface, which put increased strain and stress across the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint. I know this is a busy slide, but the plantar anatomy of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint is kind of the critical aspect of this entire pres presentation. Our profession is applied anatomy, in my opinion. Therefore, critical understanding of the, of the, um, the fundamental anatomy of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint is of utmost importance to understand how to restore said anatomy when an injury occurs. The hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint is far from a simple hinge joint. It is the confluence of seven ligaments, five tendons, four bones, and the plantar plate aponeurosis. There are static and dynamic sta stabilizers of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint that provide stability throughout the sagittal arc range of motion, in addition to uh, increased uh, degrees of mo motion or degrees of freedom with motion in pronation, supination, varus, and valgus stresses, depending on the direction of motion of the athlete. In addition, there are a variety of forefoot and hindfoot anatomic variants, including but not limited to the metatarsal head configurations from a chevron shape to a flat head that have intrinsically increased or decreased stability in certain vectors. These may play a role in the type of turf toe injury sustained and more at risk populations. Lastly, while it would be lovely to treat each portion of the foot in isolation, I believe that there is a likely contribution to the hind foot alignment to the propensity of turf toe injuries and severity associated with said injuries. The dynamic and static interplay of these structures allows the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint to function with exceedingly high forces, stresses, and strains during high intensity athletic activities such as football, ballet, and rugby. Here we have a schematic representation of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint, both in a computer, computerized diagram with the metatarsal head resected on the right, showing the medial and lateral sesamoid, the intersesamoid ligament, and the two arrows are diagramming out the phalangeal sesamoid ligament complex. On the left, you have a lateral a sagittal uh, to diagram out the collateral ligaments, as well as the flexor hallucis brevis uh, contributions at the insertion or fulcrum of the uh, sesamoids. The coronal appearance shows you the kind of confluence of the adductor and abductor muscle, musculature as they form in to make the plantar aponeurosis. Understanding the components that comprise the turf toe complex is paramount to understanding where the complex can fail 
when, how, and therefore how to address the pathology. In the setting of the colloquial term or common term of turf toe injuries, the most common location of failure is at the distal attachment or the phalangiosesmoid ligaments. That being said, there can be multiple variations of failure that involve bony ligamentous or tendinous structures. Depending on the vector of force structures involved, turf toe injuries versus traumatic hallux valgus versus sand toe injuries can occur, can occur which, in which there can be varying degrees of severity. In the setting of a bipartite sesmoid, trauma can uh, exit through the synchondrosis between the sesmoids as well um, as through the intersesmoid uh, ligament. These are often more commonly in high velocity mechanisms and traumatic dislocations of the hallux MTP joint, which was the initial quoted uh, material from the 1920s with uh, dislocation of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint and different anatomic variants for disruption of the plantar complex. Um, we'll focus more on the prior to dislocation uh, plantar plate in, or, and turf toe injuries. The biomechanics of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint has been uh, studied but continues to be an area that has to be studied further. Um, the way it behaves with anatomic normal gait patterns during the normal gait cycle with all their factors being equal, the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint undergoes cyclic loading upwards of 10,000 a day times a day, depending on the number of steps an individual takes. In New York City, where I work, the, most of my patients often walk 10,000, 20,000 steps a day, and this can be extensive and lead to micro trauma to the uh, turf toe complex. Um, the same principle of repetitive microtrauma to the turf toe complex may contribute to the risk of developing an acute turf toe injury super, superimposed on otherwise subclinical microtrauma in our athletes. The cumulative cyclic loading, shear force, and amount of force per area transferred to the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint is unparalleled in the human body. The dense cartilaginous network of the turf toe complex combined with the fulcrum nature of the sesamoid assists in forward propulsion during ambulation as well as a force coupler for generation of jumping and impact exercises. Upwards of the 80% of the body weight can be transferred through uh, the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint with normal ambulation. With running and jumping, that can be an eight-fold multiplier through this joint. Um, for example, in our offensive lineman, if you have a 300 pound lineman who then jumps off the line, that can be up to 2,400 pounds of force through the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint. And that's prior to contact with the other 300 pound lineman that is coming in contact with. Mechanism of injury noted for classic presentation of a turf toe injury is a hyper dorsiflexion moment with the foot fixed to the ground, stuck in the turf with an axial load from a player falling on the back of the hind foot or posterior ankle uh, or leg. Uh, there are still continue to be questions about the eccentric contracture or concentric contracture of the tendinous structures applied to the forefoot. Unfortunately, we're unable to test this in the in vitro setting um, and the failure is often uh, through the distal capsule ligamentous complex or the sesamoid phalangeal ligament. With the initial uh, description of this injury, there were further biomechanical analyses performed in order to assess turf toe injuries. The integrity of first metatarsal phalangeal joint was, uh, this is the first uh, biomechanical study in the English literature trying to re-demonstrate turf toe injuries. Uh, this was done in 1995 using an Incitron um, and it demonstrated in two of the five uh, cadaver models that the distal sling was disrupted. And at that time, the distal sling was the sesamoid phalangeal ligament. This uh, 
biomechanical study had uh, three different injury patterns described. Um, this is a load to failure biomechanical setting, which is not necessarily demonstrating the nature of acute turf toe injuries, which are often a uh, uh, eccentric moment on a fixed uh, body. Um, limitations of this study were understood that the load to failure was not an accurate representation of athletic turf toe injuries and it was more consistent with high velocity trauma. But that being said, Dr. Priscorn designed one of the most, the first biomechanical studies showing that at least 40% of his specimens failed through the distal sling, which is consistent with a turf toe injury. Further biomechanical studies, uh, this one being in 2002, uh, sorry, 2013, was uh, performed by Waldrop et al. and Clanton, Dr. Clanton, um, and was a redemonstration and trying to give us objective measures uh, into how to assess turf toe injuries in the clinical setting um, using stress fluoroscopy or stress radiographs uh, to diagnose severe or complete plantar plate turf toe injuries. Critical values were assessed and up to three millimeters and seven millimeters were achieved with sequential sectioning of the four critical ligaments of the distal complex, including the tibial and fibular uh, phalangeal sesamoid ligaments, as well as the collateral ligaments. Um, the importance of this study is to address and capture the patients who have significant severe injuries so that they're not missed and that they don't uh, go on to develop the sequela of a missed injury. This was based off of 24 specimens with sequential sectioning in different orders of the sesamoid phalangeal complex as well as the collateral ligaments. Of critical importance and a surprise uh, at the time, I believe, there was the order of sectioning did not play a role in uh, diastasis. In addition, if even both the phalangeal sesamoid ligaments were disrupted without a collateral ligament, there was no diastasis or instability noted about the uh, phalangeal, uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint, um, and therefore at least three ligaments were disrupted. Uh, this is of importance because this often plays a part in the varus and valgus moment or supination pronation moment at the time of the athletic injury. Classification systems. Anderson modified the original classification system described by Clanton. As in most of orthopedics, the severity of injury is associated with increased number in the grade and the highest grade being treated with surgical intervention due to the significant amount of trauma to the tissues incurred with the injury. In addition, the goal of class, any classification is to guide treatment and prognosis. The more severe the grade, the less likely that the patient is going to be able to return to sport. Um, and a longer time for recovery and more likelihood that they will require surgical intervention. Grade one, by definition, is stretching of the plantar capsule without full thickness tearing. Uh, grade two is considered to be partial tearing um, of the complex with moderate pain and swelling and limited ability to weight bear and often requires uh, immobilization and an increased duration of time for to return to play. Um, this often involves a, a toe spica splint or toe spica cast, as well as a Morton shank uh, orthosis to protect the joint from further uh, stress. And then grade three is the complete tear of the plantar capsule, significant swelling, and often requires four to six months to return to high impact exercises. Um, and we'll go into later the recovery from surgical intervention. With any of these pathologies, we often need to look at how we assess them radiographically. Standard imaging modalities include AP lateral radiographs of the affected foot in standard care, and we get contralateral weight bearing films to assess the position of the sesamoids or bipartite nature of the sesamoids on the contralateral side, as well as the shape of the metatarsal head for any impaction fractures from potential subluxation or dislocation moments. 
imaging findings on comparison views can show significant difference. The arrow shows significant retraction of the medial uh, tibial and fibular sesamoids on the left AP foot, as well as a bipartite sesamoid on the right. As you can note, the tibial sesamoid is, uh, extends further distal than the fibular sesamoid. Uh, there was a study done that showed nearly 100% sensitivity or 99.7% sensitivity for plantar plate rupture. If there's more than 13.3 millimeters from the base of the proximal phalanx to the distal pole of the lateral sesamoid, or 10.4 millimeters from the base of the proximal phalanx to the distal pole of the medial sesamoid. So the distance from here to here and here to here can be quantified and has a direct correlation uh, with the severity of the injury. Additional images to allow assessment of the sesamoids, both the tibial and fibular, can be the 40 degree oblique views, um, which can help visualize a sesamoid fracture or characterize the uh, bipartite nature of a sesamoid with the metatarsal head out of plane. Adjunct imaging modalities are critical in this setting to avoid uh, missed injuries. Lateral sesamoid stress views or Lockman and drawer tests are, allowed, are used to evaluate the amount of diastasis between the proximal failing space uh, compared to the AP radiograph in a complete tear, which was clear on the last slide. This slide shows with dynamic stress testing, you can see the it's kind of washed out a little bit, but the diagram shows that the sesamoids on the inferior image are retracted and not moving concentrically with dorsiflexion of the proximal phalanx. The distance actually widens between the proximal phalanx base. As we mentioned in the Waldrop study, if you section three or more of the ligaments, an average of increased of three millimeters would happen. Seven millimeters if it's all four, and this can often lead to a surgical intervention being undertaken. In this situation, an MRI would be recommended to look for associated other injuries, as well as osteochondral defects of the metatarsal head or loose intraarticular bodies. MRI imaging is probably the gold standard for acute turf toe injuries prior to surgical intervention to assess the nature of the injury. Um, in the acute setting, it is pretty clear often for a uh, complete turf toe injury. Um, when it is one slip of the tibular fibular phalangeal sesamoid ligament, this can often be confusing. There is also often a small notch at the base of the proximal phalanx, which is a normal recess, which can often be confused with a turf toe injury that is not present. Um, impaction injuries can happen on the dorsal head uh, in a direct dorsal injury or dorsal subluxation injury, um, or depending on the vector of the injury, can be about the dorsal lateral, dorsal medial, um, with impaction of the proximal phalanx base. Non-operative treatment, classically for grade one and grade two, initially a rate in immobilization. Uh, the kind of rice therapy that we've all been taught about. Um, as soon as range of motion is tolerated, we want to get that moving so that the patients do not develop significant arthrosis to the joint and significant stiffness or post-traumatic hallux rigidus. Um, there is often even with grade one hallux MTP joint sprains that they uh, do have up to a six degree loss of dorsiflexion, which leads to increased plantar uh, pressures about the hallux metatarsal. If there's a varus or valgus moment about the hallux metatarsal, we often use toe spacers or lateral strapping or medial strapping to correct the ligamentous um, deficit there. Absolute indications for surgery, um, an unstable metatarsal phalangeal joint, diastasis of a sesamoid fracture, retraction of a sesamoid, uh, vertical instability, um, and then failed conservative treatment is the catch-all for patients that do not recover. 
I want to present a case example of a patient that I actually operated on who was a 52 year old who was five years out from his with recurrent bouts of hallux metatarsal joint instability complaints um, with recurrent bouts of the toes swelling. Um, and this will give us a good picture on the clinical workup and treatment for these patients. Um, he had been immobilized in the toe spike cast. He tried a Morton shank before. He'd done physical therapy and unloading of his forefoot, um, but was unable to return to sport. Here are his MRI sequences that were brought in prior to evaluation. We have three sagittal cuts, one through the medial and or tibial and fibular sesamoid, demonstrating on the most inferior lateral aspects and loss of normal signal about the insertion to the uh, proximal phalanx base, but however, it's not, it's not categorically disrupted. This is somewhat more in the central aspect where you'd expect there not to be a complete connection to the phalanx base. However, this distance is increased. On the right, again, loss of signal a little bit, not the normal, but no uh, frank disruption of it there. On the coronal uh, images, we do see that the sesamoid the, uh, the complex does appear to be intact on this coronal slice. There is some evidence of thickening of the medial collateral ligament complex. However, when we assess his left side, which he has a bipartite in, uh, tibial sesamoid on his left side, which is his uninjured side, which is asymptomatic, he has a negative drawer test, which is a dorsiflexion or Lachman's test about the hallux MTB joint. So this is my hand directing his foot up. This can be done in the office under a digital block or intraarticular injection or in the operative room under general anesthesia. Um, and this is to assess congruity of the joint and instability of the joint. Uh, as in addition, dorsiflexion moment, there is no evidence of increased diastasis in between the phalanx base and the distal pole of the phalanx, and you see congruity of the metatarsal phalangeal joint. However, on his contralateral side, sorry, this should say right, the standard drawer test, you can see complete almost dislocation or dislocation of the hallux metatarsal phalangeal joint. There is rotational and diastasis of the phalanx base to the sesamoid um, and loss of normal motion under dynamic fluoroscopy with range of motion of the hallux MTP joint. This patient has no evidence of a bipartite sesamoid on the contralateral side. At this point, we proceeded to operative intervention. Adjuncts treatment for uh, treatment of turf toe injury, assessment of them uh, can be done with small joint arthroscopy through dorsal lateral and dorsal medial um, portals next to the EHL with care to avoid the dorsal neuro uh, neural structures. Um, here you can see with pretty clear certainty that there is a complete turf toe injury with significant scar about the turf toe complex. You see some irregularity about the metatarsal head um, and the sesamoids are kind of blocked by this plica. This is along his lateral border, the turf toe or the, the aponeurosis looks far more um, healthy, but there is significant injury. He also had an osteochondral defect about the phalanx base. Um, and I'm sorry that this image, but this is when we eventually opened, you could see complete disruption of the um, turf toe complex. Here we have the FHL tendon running prior to us repairing the turf toe complex. Surgical outcomes, there's a relatively paucity of uh, limited data about surgical outcomes. There's about five published data series in the orthopedic literature on published outcome. Waldrop uh, published on 15 high-level athletes that underwent surgical, uh, surgical repair, and he had excellent outcomes in 28 at 28 months with VAS scores of less than one, and all those 
players return to high level activity. Um, his average return to uh, high level athletic activity was 16.5 weeks. Anderson had uh, 19 high level athletes with grade three injuries. Only nine of the 19 underwent operative repair, but 17 of the 19 were able to return to high impact athletic activities without application, uh, without complication. Lastly, Clanton, uh, kind of the forefather of this aspect, um, had 20 cases that he had published on and with it describing it taking six to 12 months to recover from turf toe injuries. However, he noted that patients often complained of stiffness um, as well as decrease of range of motion and occasional pain. Future diagnosed uh, directions uh, associated with uh, diagnostic treatment modalities, dynamic ultrasound, dynamic MRI, positional weight-bearing CT scan are all on the forefront. Uh, the MT and PPI, I flipped this image upside down. You can kind of see that this is the metatarsal head, proximal failing space. And I think it's very user dependent, just like most ultrasound to assess and say that there's irregularity about the plantar plate or turf toe insertion of the phalangeal sesamoid ligaments. Weight-bearing CT is being used as an adjunct or treatment to see with uh, going into a on-point position to see if that will have uh, measurable outcomes of diastasis of the phalangeal sesamoid as an alternative diagnostic medium. Treatment in future directions, advanced small joint arthroscopy, nanoscope, improved minimally invasive fixation systems. Ideally, this joint um, would be less uh, dissected with open procedures. And if there's a potential for uh, placement of anchors and retrieval systems that are currently in development to retrieve and repair the, the turf toe complex, that would be ideal compared to an open procedure, which requires further immobilization prior to uh, return to function. I want to thank you all. This is my email address if you ever want to reach out to me. Uh, it's my 10-month-old son, so thank you. And what about the puppy? That's Clyde. Unfortunately, the Knicks lost, and so he's <laughs> named after Clyde Frazier. Uh, he, was, he was very sad yesterday. <laughs> that's a throwback. That's a throwback. So I, I have a few questions. I, I have to confess in front of uh, the participants that I thought those MR images you showed, I, I mean, I hope I, I didn't report that because at least from where I'm sitting, I thought they, they looked mostly normal. You can really get fooled uh, near the midline. And so I really don't know. Um, yeah, and I and, and I think I think that's a very good point. In the in the acute setting, it's often very clear. There's all the edema, the T2 weighted images, the stir images, and even the T1 weighted images often show a distinct disruption of the the capsule ligamentous complex. Um, and that's so, the so those know. stress that the, the stress radiographs that you took. Um, I mean, those were very very clear. Um, can and that's you? All the, that's all the same patient. Right. No, I understand that. So, I mean, that was grossly abnormal, whereas the MRI uh, really was unimpressive. Um, can you feel that that diastasis or, I mean, is this just a matter of documenting it on the radiographs or can you feel that diastasis or you feel the, I, I, I know, um, I know in the lesser uh, um, MTP joints, it's more of a vertical stress rather than a hyperextension, but um, because you don't have a sesamoid as 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 a, a landmark to see the gapping, can you feel the laxity on the exam? In yes, I mean, in the, in this case, it was pretty distinct and clear. Even in the office, um, I have had some of my high level athletes on the early end of things when the acute setting where they're guarding and it's a very difficult exam, and that's where the role for the digital block comes in, um, or kind of giving them enough pain control to kind of get a good exam. Um, those patients are usually getting the MRI in the first place. And I, and I would make an emphasis that that should always be a 3T MRI 
um, with a foot and ankle protocol in plane with those. Cause if you're just a little bit in a foot coil, if you're just a little bit angulated, you can miss the entire complex. And I find that in the acute ones that, you know, the MRI is not that diagnostic. That's often the issue. It's more of a protocol issue with the, the radiology. Absolutely. It's never the radiologist. So never, never the radiologist, the tech. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned um, uh, you mentioned the stiffness. Um, uh, I know that uh, that's a problem in the lesser MTP joints uh, in in a large number of people. But I, I know, for instance, I, I work a lot with uh, or um, collaborate a lot with Dr. Neri in in Sao Paulo, and he it's not really so much of an issue in his hands. Is there? Um, uh, some way you can avoid that postoperative stiffness? So I, I think as we advance our uh, techniques for surgical repair, uh, there's, I didn't want to go too much into the depth of the surgical repair technique. Um, there's different tunnel techniques through the proximal phalanx base. Some people are using um, four suture button holes. Some people are using internal brace techniques, something that the, the Basically, the more stable the construct is, the earlier we feel comfortable about stressing it and working on that range of motion. The less comfortable and the more degenerative the tear, similar to in the plantar plates of the lesser metatarsal phalangeal joints, you're less inclined to move them early. The other thing is the lesser metatarsal phalangeal joints, they're just not seeing the same force generation through that. It's all kind of pushed to the the, the toe that's driving the train, and that's the big toe. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that patients feel the stiffness in the Howitz metatarsal phalangeal joint more than the lessers. Right. Um, one of the plantar pressure studies shows that they kind of, even the patients that have MTP, um, simple uh, turf toe injuries or grade ones, they tend to load the lateral column a little bit more too. Um, so they do they transfer metatars there's transfer metatarsalgia there's you know kind of movement of the forces laterally um, whether they fully recovered or subconsciously accommodated to that injury. So do you think there's actually a role for maybe uh, operative intervention on on lower grade lesions? Not really. Um, the outcomes are. I think the quite good in 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 yeah. I mean the grade ones. ones and grade twos, like with appropriate rehab, they're they're exceedingly good outcomes with high return to high impact athletes, athletic events, and I the timeline for those injuries is not so extensive that you know we're we're worried about missing a season or not. I do think as we kind of advance things along over hopefully the next couple of years that there may be a more aggressive approach to the grade threes because there's even a, there's a school of thought that says even the grade threes should be allowed conservative uh, treatment um, as dogma. Um, and, I, and that's kind of the pro con of surgical intervention and return to, to play. Mm -hmm. um, so there's more of a personal discussion with the patient, whether they're in season, out of season, um, and the quality of the injury. So uh, another question, you look a lot uh, at a lot of these uh, MR images. I know that um, anatomically, the sesamoids are embedded in the plantar plate, right? And, and, and then you have those sesamoid phalangeal ligaments, but I can't really honestly say that on MRI, I can distinguish the sesamoid phalangeal ligaments from the plantar yeah. plate proper, can you? I, I've seen where one of them's out, like if they get like a collateral and they get more of a valgus thrust or their foot's more in a pronated position uh, in the forefoot and they get that impaction axial load where they get the medial collateral ligament complex and then the tibial phalangeal, but the energy doesn't go all the way to the fibular uh, phalangeal sesamoid ligament. Um, I also think there potentially is more of a role in that setting for an MR arthrogram um, of the MTP joint, which is not done commonly, um, similar to how we, they used to look for UCL injuries in the elbow mm -hmm. um, to kind of look for extravasation of where the fluid is and diagram out the ligamentous complex. 
at the end of the day, though, the stress exam is kind of what I hang my hat on um, because it's whether they're unstable or not. That being said, I, with my hands, am not strong enough to generate enough force as someone who's a high-level athlete jumping through their forefoot. So right. there is um, an argument to be said that they can, that may not be the most accurate uh, exam. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Waldman. Have you ever seen an isolated plantar plate tear with intact intercesmoid and phalangeal sesamoid ligaments? I, I don't see the chat. What, what, can you repeat the question? Have you ever seen an isolated plantar plate tear with intact intercesmoid and phalangeal sesamoid ligaments? And then I would add to that, how, how often nope. do you see intercesmoid ligament? Rupture. Those are usually in the traumatic dislocations. That's kind of anecdotal from the high velocity injuries where you get diastasis of the sesamoids and you can actually dislocate the, the toe dorsally with splitting of the inner sesamoid ligament. I personally have never seen it because there's not high velocity trauma in New York City, um, but um, <laughs> in, in, uh, in Houston and some of the other locations that may be more prevalent, um, and as regard for the first question, I, I don't believe that I've, I've seen that, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it can be awfully difficult, I think, to see the chondral defects, uh, um, even on, uh, a good quality MRI sometimes. Um, right. and, 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 and I, and I think we frequently miss those. I, you know, the, the MRI of that gentleman did not show an osteochondral defect on his MRI. He had a two by two millimeter OCD about his like plantar See, lateral. 2.2 millimeters really, you know, you know, at the limit of the resolution of, of the modality. Exactly. Um, so, you, you know, with this, the slice thickness, I don't think that they captures everything. Um, it's the best test we have. I do think that there's a role. What about CT arthro? Um, I think at that point, you've already committed to those patients that you're going to go to the OR. And I think that they would benefit from the diagnostic arthroscopy because that kind of is going to give you a whole lot more information on the clinical side. Um, I think if CT arthrogram, if you're going in the acute setting, are you delaying their treatment before they get to the OR? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure i'm not sure about that i'll have to think about that further i wonder i i mean i've I, i've never done ct arthur i wonder if anybody here has i mean is there something that we would get out of the mri that we wouldn't get on the ct arthro i i, I I'm, I'm not really sure i mean it's not no. really so important to know whether there there's marrow edema right i mean right yeah i i don't think we're gonna gain a ton of actionable data from that um, you would capture you would capture the chondral defects right i mean right in 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 addition i mean you're going to get the mri to look at the other capsule ligamentous injury mm -hmm. so is that but i think you probably see that on the ct i i don't know i'm just uh putting no i i think it's a good line of thought i just i i don't and do you do ultrasound in the office with these patients? I do. Um, I also do it under stress fluoroscopy as well. And I find that at least in my hands, I am not the best uh, diagnostic ultrasound technician. Um, and I, I mean, I, I've only been referred very few cases to evaluate turf toe on ultrasound. And in each yeah. instance, I, I thought they were intact. So I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I mean that that one though I showed earlier is like supposedly one of the more standard appearances of a tear of the insertion, and I don't feel that I could even tell when they're saying that that is one of the classic. Well, the beauty is usually, <laughs> I I don't think people get bilateral turf toe injuries, so so you have you have that other foot to compare to. That's. Yeah, that's fair, but I, I just, it, not in my hands, at least not yet. Um, I think the ultrasound technology is getting better and the resolution is getting exceptional. 
Well, um, it is really exceptional and, for for the I, you know small and I, field review, and it's a superficial structure. Yeah, and I, I think there there's role there. I think you probably need a third hand. Um, the nice thing about this stress fluoro is you've got both hands on the foot and the floor is in a standard position. Um, I think it's, you know, as you're using the ultrasound probe and trying to mobilize the patient, if they're in pain, you may have a little bit more difficulty with the ultrasound, um, just as a technical point, but I... I'll run over. I'll run over the next time you have an acute... Please do. I'm, I'm all, <laughs> I'm always looking to improve. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Seidman, uh, for, for sharing this time with us. I, I know you have uh, mm -hmm. a complicated patient to take care of. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate know. the time. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So um, thank you so much. Uh, and thank to everybody for joining us.